Welcome to the Strange Films Podcast, a place for filmmakers, actors, and other creatives. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Strange Films Podcast. If you are new to the show, we are here always showcasing other filmmakers, actors, creatives, and I am so happy to have another filmmaker friend of mine. This is Tom Danucci, and uh, this is the Big 40 episode also, so this is a special episode. Tom, how are you, my friend? I appreciate you. Thank you for your time. Oh, thanks for having me today, August. It's good to be here. Episode 40, that's a nice even number. We love that. Uh, uh, yeah. So I'm excited, uh, I'm excited to catch up with you today. Yeah, yeah. It's. I feel like, uh, well, thank you also because I know we've kind of rescheduled this a couple of times now. I've wanted to get you on the show for a little while. Uh, life gets in the way, of course, but uh, but we're here now and we're doing it and uh, I'm a fan of your work. Oh, thanks, man. And I, like I was telling you before, it's uh, kind of the cool thing about social media. You know, you randomly <laughs> like somebody's post and you go back and forth. The next thing you know, it, uh, you're getting to chat with them in real life. So uh, pretty cool to make that connection. And I'm excited to talk movies with you. Yeah, of course, man. Uh, so, so Tom, on this show, we love to showcase uh, these uh, filmmakers like yourself. Um, so for my audience who might not be familiar with your work, if you'd like to take an opportunity here to kind of introduce yourself and what you're all about and uh, how you got started. Yeah, my name is Tommy Danucci. I'm from uh, Rhode Island. I love making movies. I got into the business uh, really right out of film school as an intern and quickly wrote a horror movie. Always loved horror movies. Uh, kind of seemed to be like during this boom when I first started making movies about 10 years ago horror movies were at this place where movies for about a million dollars half a million to a million dollars with one really big name actor from the horror genre and a bunch of as they call them no names it was a really successful kind of marketplace for that and uh, those kind of scripts were hot and I wrote this kind of catchy script called self storage, which uh, got a little bit of buzz and quickly got acquired. Uh, and next thing you knew it, no, it, I, I was making my first movie pretty quickly out of the gate. Um, and you know, one thing I tell a lot of filmmakers that ask me like, well, how do you do it? How do you do it? I'm like, always really try to make that first one. Cause once you make your first movie, it's so much easier to make your second and your third. Once you say like, Oh, here's my movie. You can go watch it here. And it suddenly kind of makes everything real because there's a lot of people walking around saying that they're movie makers but they don't really have any movies that have, they've made so like even if it's a low budget anything like just have something to, to prove to, to show that you this is what you do uh so i got into horror movies and uh you know quickly made a few of them right one after the other but i kind of knew that i wanted to to do something more uh and i i wrote a crime drama uh with my co-writer b dolan called vault which is about a very famous heist that took place in providence rhode island you know i'm an italian american so like if you're an italian american and you love movies you probably have always grown up wanting to make a mob movie you know whether it's you know movies to me movies like casino and goodfellas you know the, the scorsese films like th those movies godfather obviously those are the kind of movies that you know i really relate to and always wanted to kind of emulate my own way uh, so the story of Vault was told, which is basically about one of the largest heists in American history. There was this really cool like mob vault that is basically the, the first bank of the mob where all the gangsters would put their money and it got robbed one day. Uh, and uh, this is the story of that robbery. And it took place literally 10 minutes from where I grew up, which is kind of fun uh, to get to tell that story. And then from there, uh, you know, made a, just made a movie with Megan Fox, which was really fun called Johnny and Clyde. Kind of like a supernatural heist movie a little bit of my heist background a little bit of my supernatural background combine them together uh, and that pretty much leads us to here which is uh on august 4th which is uh coming up real soon uh or maybe by the time this airs it'll be out uh but that's uh the collective which is my first crack at the full-blown action movie genre it's it's really just a good old-fashioned spy movie it's it's almost like a an American James Bond with a little bit of an assassin twist to it. And I'm really excited about that movie. I mean, like, that's fascinating to me because, you know, you say, you know, you just kind of got started, like, by just making a movie right out the gate. And that's, and like you said, when people were asking, how do I make, how do I make these movies and stuff? It's like, that's, that's kind of like the theme of the show. We always try to bring value to the show. So we're always like, yeah, you know, every, every guest has a perspective of how do you just kind of just get started, just go do it, even if it's with your phone or a low budget with your friends, your family, 
you know, that's that's just the perfect way to get started because that builds confidence, that builds skill, even if it's like not the prettiest thing in the world. Um, but you have grown to this really, really successful filmmaker right now. Like you said, you were just making a movie with Megan Fox. I mean, I've seen a list of celebrities that you've been working with recently. Like, I mean, Tyrese Gibson and uh, Ruby Rose. I mean, like this is uh, this is wild. So how do you feel kind of being in your position now, 10 years later uh, from right, you know, when you first started? Well, I appreciate you saying that, man. Uh, thank you very much. And, you know, sometimes it, it's one of those things where, like, I still kind of feel like I'm that guy right out of film school that wrote that script. And I can't even believe that I'm here and I'm working with all these people. Uh, so I do still feel that way and get that excited about it. And that's what kind of keeps me going. The fact that I've been doing this for a while now and I still get equally excited when I'm about to break into a new project. Um, you know, I'm one of those kind of people that... Um, I like structure, but at the same time, I like to have some flexibility in life. And the great thing about making films is you've got a tremendous amount of structure in this window of flexibility where you get to make a project, you put your entire heart and soul into a project, and then you walk away from it. And it's almost like you're vacating a town, like a deserted town, and it's gone, and you'll never return to that city again. <laughs> and it's kind of funny uh, because you put so much into it then it's kind of on to the next town, on to the next mission. Um, so I think that's what's kind of kept me going is the fact that I'm, I'm rarely satisfied. Uh, I'm always, you know, even my best films, I watch them and I'm like, uh, you know, if I did a hundred things right, I'm always going to like, you know, really get upset and, and obsess over the four or five things I did wrong. And, you know, I'm going to think about those for next time. So it's like, I think that's what always keeps me being like, okay, what's next? Like the second I film a movie, I'll take a couple days off and I'll always say it. Like you can ask my friends. I'll be like, I'm not doing shit for like two, three weeks. I'm not doing anything. Like nothing creative. Like fuck that. Like I'm just going to hang out. I'm going to play video games. I'm going to chill. And then like three days into it, I'm like, all right. So there's a train movie about a train <laughs> and there's money on the train. And I'm like already like, I can't help it. And that's the yeah. problem with being an artist. Like, uh, it's hard to shut your brain off, but I think that's what keeps us motivated and always moving. Yeah, you said so many so many interesting, relatable things there. I mean, like I'm the same way. I, after I get done with shooting a movie, I'll take a week before I start organizing the footage and kind of you know getting that even prepped for edit because I'm like that's I need I need to decompress, I need to kind of let go of that. And then I'm like, yeah, I do want to take it easy for a while. But like you said, it never turns off. So I've always like those ideas that I had before even the project that took priority are starting to kind of kick back up again or something else inspired me, you know, things like that. And, you know, it is interesting with filmmaking with, you know, like you said, like leaving the next, like kind of leaving the town, going to the next one. It's like with these characters sometimes, you know, you kind of really grow to love these characters and because you spent so much time crafting them and learning from your actors and things like that. So it's like once you once the movie's done, though, it's kind of like, all right, goodbye. And it's almost like a breakup, you know, kind of like uh, this is uh, this is sad where we're at here. But. Yeah, it really is. You, you can develop these fast friendships where it's like, you know, you work with somebody for literally like four or five days and it's like you've got this fellowship now like forever. Uh, and it's nice. You have these great memories, but it is too bad when you have to. You know, it, it's everybody's got to say goodbye at, at some point. But again, wrapping it back to social media, I've been able to establish and continue really great relationships with a lot of talent that I've worked with through social media. And, you know, uh, the old uh, I call it being in a liker gang where mm -hmm. it's like, hey, I'm going to like your stuff. You're going to like my stuff. We're going to pay attention to what each other's got yeah. going on. And just kind of like stay in touch, you know. You're in the liker gang. I kind of think other. that's how we we got acquainted there. I don't know how, but we we started liking each other's stuff, following each other, and and then you know casual conversation here and there, and here we are. Um, now, do you would you say? Because um, I'm just generally curious about kind of how you elevated to get some of these like larger name talents and whatnot. Now, was social media a big play into that with your film career, kind of you know coinciding like? And uh, that led you to some opportunities or did you just kind of naturally fall into some sort of uh, network that helped you out with that? I'd say it was a little bit of both. You know, I, I worked with a, a really great producer by the name of Chad Verdi right out of the gate. And he really supported me and got behind a lot of my projects. He was one of the first people to really, really get what my first movie, Self Storage. It was just such a hookable, easy horror movie to make. And he really understood that and got it. 
and gave me my opportunity, man, you know, gave me the, the chance, you know, I think I was like 27 years old and he was like, okay, uh, you can go direct this movie. And, uh, that was a really special moment, uh, because that gave me the confidence to be like, yeah, you know what? I, I can direct this movie. Let me go do it. Um, and yeah, I made a thousand mistakes on that movie, but like, Hey, that was the first one. Next movie, I probably made 900 mistakes and then you make 800 mistakes and it gets, gets less and less. Um, so I think it was part of being, uh, you know, having the support of a really great producer like Chad Birdie, who was like, almost like, to, I don't know if you're a sports guy, but almost to like use a reference, like, was willing to go with a rookie, even though you might lose a couple games, but the rookie is going to get some really good experience. And a couple seasons down the road, they could go out and win a lot of games and give you a chance to win almost every time. So I think like he was willing to let me, you know, learn on the job a little bit. Um, and that gave me a lot of confidence. And then with that, I always kind of thought social media was like kind of the next thing. You know, I was always a big believer in, in marketing and, you know, marketing fascinated me. Uh, I, I, I've read books, you know, I've, I've read Ted Turner's book, uh, and I, I've read, uh, you know, I've always been a, just a big fan of like how you can take an idea and a concept and make it a little bit bigger. And social media was really blown up. Like when I started this whole thing and I was seeing a lot of filmmakers build this network and I was seeing this, there's a really great film community on, on all social media platforms learning what other artists are doing and getting ideas from other artists and seeing what people are doing. It's motivating. You know, I've always been like, Hey man, when I see someone else working, I want to work on something. Like I want to go do something. Um, so I always just kept up with that. And I think that helped a lot because slowly I've been able to, to build a pretty nice following and, and meet a lot of really cool people. And it's a weird thing, man. Like a lot of people think social media is bullshit, but I can probably tell you that I've, I've probably booked jobs before because of a decent, social media following because if it comes down to it you know like if you know eventually a movie's going to have to be promoted i mean look at us now like now we're in a weird situation where the actors can't even promote the movie because of the sag strike so it's like that might be the little edge if you have a bigger social media following when it comes down to promoting something somebody might want to be like yeah let's go with this one instead of that one just because they're gonna put the movie out harder you know Right. Yeah. Yeah. Social media is like a tough game. I mean, it's um, I think if you're genuine about it, just put yourself out there and, and being engaged with other people. It's a really, really great tool. It's definitely a great networking opportunity. Um, you know, there's definitely that other line of just people consuming social media and not, nothing, you know, to pr not participating and whatnot as well, which I think that's kind of where people are like, well, I'm not getting the followers. I'm not getting this and that. It's like, well, we got to it's a community if you think about it, you know, and especially with filmmaking or any art form, you know, creators kind of kind of stick together, even though there's so many of us, you know, there's a lot of that, ind that independent, uh, that independent look at things is, is definitely still has always been true, no matter if it's on social media or, you know, off social media. But now uh, speaking of uh, the strike, though, I mean, we've got you've got a new movie coming up. So I didn't know if you were able to promote that movie or not. The Collective is coming out. Uh, which uh, is starring you know, Ruby Rose. We got Lucas Till, Tyrese Gibson, Don Johnson. I mean, what an all-star cast there. I just watched the trailer for it just to kind of refresh myself before we hopped on here, and it looks fantastic, man. I mean, it Thanks. looks really, really good. So I Thank didn't know you. if you wanted to share any thoughts about the collective itself here. Yeah, I'm so excited for that movie, man. You know, I got to, to uh, work on that one with uh, producer Richard Switzer, who's a really good friend of mine. We've uh, made a couple other movies together. Uh, and he gave me a call one day and he was like, Hey man, I got this script. It's called the collective. It's an action movie. And I hadn't done an action movie before, but he's like, check it out. I think you're going to like it. And what I noticed about it right away was, although it's an action movie, it's got some horror elements, although it's an action movie, it's got some crime drama elements. And those are kind of the two, you know, playgrounds that I've, I've messed around in. So I, I was like, Oh, this is going to be kind of fun. And I immediately, just as I was reading the script, got these, you know, crazy imagery that's what always happens like i'll be reading the script and and just seeing the scenes in my head uh to the point where i could almost like close my eyes and draw you a picture of like what i'm seeing and when i start i don't get those ideas every script that's like a script that's really you know stimulating my brain uh so i was having like a lot of those images as i'm reading the script i'm like oh i like that oh this is i'm seeing the movie uh and i i quickly called richard and i'm like yeah i'm in like let's do this um, and it was just really exciting. It was my first action movie. First time getting a chance to really spend time in prep with a really talented stunt coordinator by the, the name of Anthony Wang. 
uh, and seeing kind of like how how much how many dividends that pays when you get a chance to be like with your stars and the stunt team working all the beats out. It's a big dance, right? You know, like it's all paint by numbers, choreography. How do you make it look super dangerous and violent? But at the end of the day, nobody's got a broken nose. Nobody's got a tooth knocked out. It's a science to that. And uh, having the extra time, spending the days that we did just working the stunts with the with the lead cast, that's, that's why some of these fights look as strong as they do. And keep in mind, we shot this whole movie in 15 days. So it wow. was like, a it, yeah, it was a blip. Uh, it went by really fast. So our prep time was really important. And we just had to be so on point because there was no time to think about anything on set. You just had to like go out and do it uh, and execute the plan. Uh, but the cast was phenomenal, like you said. Lucas Till, uh, he, he's an action hero, uh, if, if you've ever seen one. He was our quarterback, uh, you know, did a lot of his own stunt work. Uh, I read the script, and I remember being like, man, this guy, like, kicks a lot of ass. Uh, whoever <laughs> plays this part is going to have to, like, pre pretty physical, you know, to do this. And luckily, like, the first day I met Lucas, he's like, oh, yeah, I've, I've trained some Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I've, I've trained a lot of martial arts since I was a kid. So it was really nice to see that, like, you know, he knew how to throw a punch. He knew how to fall properly. Like, a lot of those things, like, we couldn't have taught. We can't just teach him that in, like, two days. Um, Tyrese is a legend, you know. I mean, working with Tyrese was something else. It was cool, too, because it was, like, right around the time when Fast and the Furious uh, X what wasn't too far from coming out. Mm -hmm. Ruby Rose is just a, a wonderful person to work with. She's a total delight. Um, and I think people are going to, like, she usually plays – the good guy. She's kind of playing a bad guy in this one. So mm -hmm. she's playing a little villain in this one, um, which is cool. And I really enjoyed working with guys like character, you know, Paul Ben Victor is like one of the, the, the more underrated character actors out there. I think like he's a super talent and people are really going to see a, a badass villain with like a wacky twist. That's kind of unusual. Uh, and, and last, but certainly not least, you know, obviously uh, Don Johnson is, another legend and I've worked with him before and it was really cool because I, kind of, I worked with him on vault. I was a little nervous at first because it's Don Johnson, you know, he's a, he's a legend. I'm some young director coming up with it to him, telling him what to do. You know, I was afraid of him this time. It was nice. It was the second time around. I had already had that rapport with him. So it was all hugs. It was all good. Um, oh yeah. And of course, Mercedes Fernando wrestling fans out there, you know, wrestling fans know this non wrestling fans don't, but Mercedes Vernado, a.k.a. Mercedes Monet, uh, she's probably one of the best, if not the best, female professional wrestlers on the planet. She's super talented. Um, she's highly regarded throughout the world for being that top performer. So it's really cool. This is her big screen debut. You know, nice. she's obviously in The Mandalorian. Uh, she plays, you know, one, one of the Mandalorian kind of uh, warriors in that show. But this is her first movie. So I, I felt very privileged to be directing Mercedes first movie and you're going to see her really mix it up. And it was so much fun. I mean, she's such an athlete. So it was fun to like, just see her like so easily uh, kind of just soak up the stunt beats and be like, what do you need me to do? Yeah. Okay. Let me go do it. And then just boom, like a 18 hit combination maneuver with a backflip. And she's like doing it. I'm like, this is insane. Uh, so she's, yeah, she was really cool to work with. Um, and I'm a huge wrestling fan too. So that was extra fun. Yeah. That's incredible, man. I, I, I heard from a friend a long time ago. Um, you know, every movie we make is kind of like a response to our last one. We're like, you know, like we're just like, we're learning. Like you said, like you, you made a thousand mistakes before maybe 900 the next and 800, you know, it goes on from there. So is your, um, how would you say, like your roots of kind of how you got started and the knowledge you had to where you are now making such a ambitious project with all this talent and everything. Like, does some of that still stick there and you kind of are still relying on some of those roots or, you know, like how's that process now with you, with everything? You know, I think it really comes down to, you know, not to be like quoting, the, you know, Bruce Lee here, but it's like the law of 10,000 kicks. You know, if you do something over and over and over and over again, you kind of just uh, it becomes like breathing. And like I've just seen it really it's I don't want to sound negative when I say this, but I've seen so many things go wrong. Like I've really I've, I've made so many mistakes coming up and I've zigged when I should have zagged. That like if you make enough mistakes and you learn you learn enough on the spot and like you're tested under fire 
and you deal with so many different personalities and you've seen what it's like to have maybe a lead actor not have the best day and how do you deal with that or maybe a location falls through and you got to scramble like like all the other again i'm not even talking about mistakes that i made i'm talking i'm talking about just like the movie gods are restless that day and something crazy happened and the sprinklers went off and now you got to re rewrite the scene on the fly when enough of these things happen and you have enough experience like over time like you're just gonna like immediately know kind of how to adjust because making films is a lot about adjusting because we all know that you could have the best plan in the world and you might show up and the actor might just be like i don't want to do that i'm not doing that and it's like now, now what are you going to do you know like that's the thing they don't tell you in film school you know i wish they told me that uh you could have this awesome plan cooked up and your lead actor that is going to be on the poster that got paid a, lo a lot of money to be here that is the only reason why your movie has distribution by the way is because it's been pre-sold based on that person's face when you tell them an idea and they just go no, i'm not doing that boss they'll call you boss even uh and now what do you do you know yeah. you're gonna scream at them you're gonna yell you're gonna you know boss them or really cause an even bigger problem no you gotta work with them you gotta be creative you gotta explain to them why you want to do what you want to do you gotta hear them out you gotta maybe see if you can meet in the middle so like these are all things that over time you just adapt like i was very easy to trample over when i first started making movies you know my lead actors would would kind of run the show and i'd be like yeah that sounds good to me mm -hmm. uh yeah of course i had some ideas and i implemented my ideas and i had my plan but if a lead actor wanted to change something i was going to let them do whatever the fuck they wanted to do and again like now that I've, now I've learned to like have the discussion explain why you want to you know well maybe we do this differently and and i've learned that like it's okay to communicate with them you know you don't have to have a, a confrontation but like you can explain to them why it's really important to you and and that's the best way to do it so that your creative doesn't get completely trampled over and those are just things that you can't learn that in a book you only just learn that from like doing it over and over again so that's that's my roundabout answer to yeah that. yeah i mean communication is key um and it sounds like even on the lowest level of indie production to you know, directing talents as big as Tyrese Gibson or, you know, just like those, any production, you have to kind of have that communication with your talent and your crew and everything like that. And, um, now, I watched an interview with you on, uh, I think it was like a PBS with Rhode Island, and you were talking about uh, making the, uh, or being a part of the boxing movie with Miles Teller. Uh, was it Bleed Like This? Is that what it was called? Bleed for This, yeah. Bleed for This, Bleed for This. Um, and you were demonstrating how you do these storyboards with action figures. Is that something you still do? I thought that was so fascinating. I thought that was really, really cool. I'm yeah, a collector it's... myself. I love collecting figurines and stuff like that. So I thought that was just really interesting approach of kind of how you storyboard and kind of craft these ideas at your house or something, then bring them to the set. I appreciate that, man. Actually, while we're talking, I'm kind of just playing with this. I got a small <laughs> Rancor monster in my in my hands. Nice. Uh, so, so they're just action figures have always just been a thing in my life. Like since I was a little kid, like most most kids around the age of like, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, probably 12 ish. Uh, you start saying, I don't really need to buy these anymore. I just never stopped. I always thought they were cool. I always collected them. I was, you know, I'm, I'm not in the backyard playing with them on my hands and knees. I'd put them on a shelf and there was a nice little conversation piece. Uh, and then I went to make uh, the movie with Megan Fox, Johnny and Clyde. And man, I was very afraid uh, to work with Megan Fox, not because of Megan Fox. Megan Fox is awesome. She's uh, super chill to work with and a, actually really a funny person, great sense of humor. Uh, I wasn't afraid to work with her personally. I was afraid because I knew that I had a lot to shoot with her in only three days to shoot it in. Oh, so yeah. I was like, shit, what, what do I do? And again, it's back to the like, at that point in my career, even though this was only a few years ago, I hadn't fully honed in on the like, all right, this is exactly how I want to shoot this scene ahead of time. I would still like show up to set and have to like walk around and think about it a little bit more. Whereas now I feel a little more confident in like, building that shot list ahead of time. I wasn't there yet. Uh, so what I did was I painstakingly got out the action figures and built sets. My uh, director of photography and I, Glenn Ciano, uh, Glenn brought over a bunch of flashlights and we lit the scenes and it really helped, man. And it was just like my iPhone and just kind of taking these shots. And then we put them in the computer and, and arranged them all. 
and made a book. And that was basically our storyboard. Uh, it was kind of cool. You know, there's something about like sitting down with Megan Fox being like, yeah, see, uh, that's you. Uh, and she was just like, wow, this is crazy. Um, and it's that extra level of detail that I think when an actor sees that, they probably say to themselves like, one, this guy's a little weird. I kind of, maybe that's cool. I don't know. It's weird though. Uh, and two, he's really thinking about like what, what he's doing. Like there's some serious time and effort put in here. Um, and I don't know about you, man, but those are the kind of people that I want to be in battle with creatively, like people that are really putting that time in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one thing to kind of, you know, you're trying to put that effort into the pre-production stuff. So when you get on set, even if you have to figure it out on the fly, you do have like the bare bones of what you want to get accomplished. But it's another when you also have like an actress or an actor of talent who has been crafting their own ideas and thoughts and style into the character into like the scene of the script and they're like hey i th I have all these ideas presented for you when we shoot this and uh because i'm kind of going through that right now with my with my uh talent for our next shoot and uh and and, and i've been having that recently with my last few shoots and it's just really nice because you can kind of get on this equilibrium like wave of understanding and and even if one thing takes out is taken out here or added there i mean I feel like overall it just ends up being a much better production. Yeah, exactly. You want people to be bringing those kind of ideas. You know, you want your talent to come equipped with a whole notebook of, you know, backstories and ideas and notes. And I love seeing that, man. I mean, the worst is when people show up and they don't really care and they don't have anything mm -hmm. to contribute. You know, I'd rather, I'd rather, you know, we say this a lot. I didn't invent this. You probably heard it before, but like, you always, it's always easier to pull someone back than it is to like, jack up a performance so it's like you'd rather have them come with all these ideas and pick and choose what you want to pull out and uh you know make something nice yeah absolutely um i wanted to dive into another endeavor you've got which is a podcast that you host on uh, youtube and everything is called and action i believe it's a, just a filmmaking podcast you have with a co-host and you guys talk a lot about like the nitty-gritty stuff about filmmaking and everything uh but i wanted to have a chance to kind of hear from you and what that show is all about Thanks, man. You know, I uh, I was kind of inspired to do a podcast almost just at, to, as, as like almost this uh, simple form of therapy to just get out there and talk about my experiences. Uh, and I'm a big fan of the Conrad Thompson pro wrestling ad free shows podcast. And these are all these podcasts about wrestling. And what they do is each week they talk about either a different wrestler or a different event uh, that took place different topics like that. And then I said to myself, well, that'd be kind of a, a cool idea to almost adapt to my personal movie career where it's like, well, one week I could talk about a movie that I was in as an actor. Then the next week I could talk about just writing the first draft of a script. Then the week after that, we'll talk about music and movies. Uh, and then the week after that, I'll do a deep dive on like an actor. Like for example, today we did Kevin Nash, uh, who was in a few movies that I, I worked on. And I'll just do like a kind of a deep dive on that. And I have a co-host by the name of Mike Messier. And uh, Mike and I have even worked on a few projects together. So we know a lot of the same people. And we just tell stories. And, you know, we try to have some fun. We try to keep it related uh, to film. And, and you know, at the end of the show, I think everybody kind of learns a little something. Because I'm very, uh, you know, you'll find it about me. I'm very open about, you know, I'm not trying to hide any missteps. You know, I've made some movies that I'm really proud of and I love. And then I've made some movies that, you know, if this were boxing, they'd say, oh, I bet you wish you had that fight back. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I wish I had that one back. Um, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, that's how you learn. That's how you become better. And uh, everybody has a different path to where they're going. Um, and on and action, we like to just kind of talk about all those different paths that you can take. And, uh, I, I, and we have a great community that we built up, people that are kind of consistently watching along and chatting it up um so if you're into that check me out on youtube you can just kind of punch in tom Danucci film uh, and every tuesday at 11 a.m eastern we do a show uh so come join us chat it up you don't have to watch along live but if you do you can interact with us in, in real time and we'll literally stop the show and talk to you <laughs> yeah that's cool i mean i always like live show i, I used to do a live show before i did this podcast um if, you know, community interactions always you know makes it a lot more entertaining and fun but um but no that's great man i'm gonna put the, the script or the links to your channel and everything in the show notes that way hopefully people will check that out because i do think shows like that uh value 
you know when you're talking about filmmaking especially indie filmmaking and whatnot like you know that uh, for the aspiring creatives out there who are wanting to gain something out of that it, it'll you definitely can get something out of that and that's what we try to do on this show as well um so that's really cool uh like i said i'll put the put that link in the show notes hopefully you guys should can check out and action the filmmaking podcast from tom Danucci. Um, thanks man yeah of course well speaking of value we always try to bring value to the show so i always ask all my guests um if the, if you have some sort of advice perspective uh that you can offer whether it's even just like something you struggled with on your journey or something that you can just kind of, uh, you know, give some two cents on to help an aspiring filmmaker to when they get started. Um, yeah. Is that something you could? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, earlier we were talking about social media followings and we were talking about how to build it up and you had mentioned something that really kind of struck out, struck, stuck out in my mind, which is, you know, a lot of times you make a few videos and you don't quite get the, the likes and the views and the shares that you maybe thought you would have, even though you spent a lot of time on it, you worked really hard on it. You had really great music. You did a good job, but just people just didn't like it. just didn't hit. And that can kind of be really discouraging and it can make you want to stop. It can make you want to kind of pull back the troops. Maybe I'll, maybe yeah, Tuesday comes along when you're supposed to do your show. And you're like, yeah, do we have to do it? And then you stop doing it. Well, like I just encourage people, like, especially early on, like whatever, creative venture you're after whether it's a podcast whether it's a weekly vlog uh whether it's your movies you know it's that script that you're writing you like you you really just have to put the time in and like even if it's like the first 10 videos literally a dozen people watch it eventually if you put out something quality and you're consistent people are going to react to that people want something that they can kind of grab a hold of and they know that it's going to be there every week. So you just got to continue to be there for them. And and it's like, you know, the, like the, uh, the field of dreams, like if you build it, they will come kind of a thing. Um, and cause that's how it was with my podcast. And again, listen, we're not getting millions of views here, but it's slowly been growing and there's people that every week check it out. And I remember those first couple episodes when I was like, is anyone going to watch this? Is anyone going to care? And like, the truth is people might care because a lot of times it's like, uh, it's easy to look at some, you know, yeah, I'd like to be like Steven Spielberg, but I'm never going to climb that mountain. Whereas I feel like people could see me, they go, like, I could do that. I could do what that guy's doing. And that's what I want people to say. I want them to say like, oh, well, it seems like you, that, that was a pretty solid approach. I could probably do that. Uh, you know, I'm trying to inspire people while also trying to get out there. So uh, that would be my mistake. Just don't quit when it gets kind of tricky. Uh, and when it comes to writing too, like I hear this a lot, like people often talk about writer's block. And I don't believe in that. Like when people talk about writer's block, I, I just want to be like, that's a, that's a bullshit excuse. There's no such thing as writer's block. That's in your head. And that's your way of manufacturing excuses to not move forward. So like, this sounds funny, but like when I hear about writer's block, I'm like, just write some shit, write the worst fucking pages you've ever read in your life. Like make it a mission to write the worst scene ever. <laughs> And go write that worst scene. Yeah. And a lot of times the next day, it's like, you'll read that worst scene ever. And you're like, hey, you know what? This isn't a good scene, but I can use this part. Mm -hmm. That line of dialogue is actually pretty good. So like, just don't stop writing. Always keep the creative energy flowing. Even if you think it's the biggest piece of shit ever. And you're, you're, you're disgusted by what you're typing. Put something on the page because 10% of it might be useful. And that would have been better than just being like, oh, I'm not inspired. I'm going to go take a drive. I'm going to go get ice cream or whatever. You know, just you got to put that time in. So right is right. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I, I, I read something in a screenwriting book a few years ago where it was just like, yeah, you know, because I always I made the mistake early on in my screenwriting career where it's like, and I mean, I, it, only the last couple of years, I kind of finally got away from that habit. You know, you write like 10 pages here. OK, then you come back to it. You write five more like. I don't like what I did with that first 10 pages. <laughs> Let me delete all that. Cause I got this idea. This is how I should work. Or if you're getting like, you know, 30 pages in, but you don't know how to get to that second act when you know what you're trying to get to, but you don't know how to get there. It's like, well, just write a car blows up and then you just move on from there to get, you know, just to keep pushing forward. Cause then you can always edit that part where the car blows up, you know, just, you know, but it's just one of those things where, yeah, just write something, fucking absurd you know and just so you can keep moving forward and then you can always come back and edit that 
Yeah, the second act's always going to be the toughest act for the yeah. writers out there. You know, it, listen, anyone can come up with the setup to a movie. Of course, the first, the first act is like a big, big deal. Okay, great. Yeah, a lot of people come to me with these movie ideas, and they're always like, "Tom, I got." I'm sure you get this too. If you're in the, any kind of movie business, people love to pitch you ideas, right? They think that you're you're <laughs> essentially the guy to go to with the idea. So, Tom, I got this great idea for a movie, and then I go all right, now what happens? And then it's like, oh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so, like, it's easy to get a setup, and it's easy to get a finish. That middle part, man, that's where it can really fall off the tracks. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't I don't know. Uh, what, what is your – let me flip this thing around. What is your advice for that, that middle act? What are you trying to do in your second act? To uh. keep people excited, to set it up, to get that action rising? What do you, you know, what, give, give us, give me a good tip. Teach me something about the second I don't know, act. man. You're, <laughs> um, it, you know, I think it's just so different for every project on my end. I mean, because, you know, when you've got like a producer or something, we've got like, I mean, you're on a different level than I am right now, but like, ah, come on. But I'm just saying, like, when, when you're writing, I feel like I have to really, really understand my story before I kind of dive into like that full draft of things. I mean, because that second half, I mean, that second act can definitely get me stuck but for me i think my most uh the way i like to kind of progress things in the story is just to kind of keep coming up with like things that i feel like i wouldn't see or hear in the real world so that's kind of for like let me throw a curveball in here that's gonna fuck with the audience and also fuck with me and my characters a little bit you know and kind of get send them on like a divergent of what's about you know what they're trying to get to just to kind of add some more maybe intensity or drama or things like that you know i think it's just more of like kind of and again it's different for every project but you just allowing the the narrative to kind of take a little bit of a curvy turn you know sure. left and right left and right and then get back onto the the main road of where we're trying to get to yeah, that's why writing's so fun, you know. Like I, I often, I really try to adhere to a strict outline. To me, that's like the roadmap, and I follow it as much as I can. But every once in a while, I'll be writing, and I'm sure you've done this. Like you almost like surprise yourself, and you're like, yeah. "Ooh, wait a minute, boom!" And you, and you like, you swerve yourself, uh, and that's yeah. that's always fun when that stuff happens in the writing room. Uh, that's when it's. Again, these are the weird victories in life because you're usually by yourself. It's usually some weird time of day when no one's around. Mm -hmm. And like, you can't, like, what are you going to do? Are you going to jump up and down? You know, you can't, you can't, there's, right. no one around, there's no one around. It's one of the truly, like, one of those only things that you can, like, celebrate yourself. Uh, but yeah. it's a great feeling. And I think another thing just for me, um, when I have, when I know I have, like, a certain talent on board with the project and I'm writing based around that talent because i know like their mannerisms or i know like things like that it helps me really guide that character through the story so i can kind of lay it out a little bit more you know and and kind of plot around that or like how they're going to react to certain things i want to bring up but yeah like getting surprised in the writing itself is always a lot of fun too so it's a wacky it's a wacky business i don't know it's yeah, yeah. And, and things evolve even on set you know you just never know like how it's even going to turn out a lot of my films have always been completely different i mean not like a hundred percent but something has changed or evolved by in the finished finished project or product than uh you know how i originally conceived it on paper so yeah very interesting um i just have um you know a couple more thoughts here before uh, we wrap up here but you know the state of indie filmmaking um you know i feel like we've been in like this big kind of new indie filmmaking renaissance lately especially with the horror genre um i know we've got a lot of big things going on in hollywood right now with the strikes and everything but do you think we're we are kind of like as far as indie filmmaking goes do you think like uh, it is a really, really good time to be an indie filmmaker. I know there's so many of us out there making a lot of fun stuff and it's great to support each other, but it's a little bit of a flooded market and whatnot. And it's really hard to kind of stand out. But where do you think, where do you kind of, what's your take on all, all that right now? I think that there's very rare, there haven't been too many better times to be an indie filmmaker because there are, as they say, so many different marketplaces to sell your product, your movie, your TV show. There's a thousand platforms out there right now. Like there are so many platforms and we've heard it before. It's a buzzword. It gets annoying to even hear this word, but content, 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 like everyone's looking for content. So 
you know, there was a time when it was a really small uh, sort of window as far as places where you can get your product and sell it and put it out to the market in a mass volume to the point where people other than your friends and family are going to actually see the movie. It's going to be broadcast somewhere. It's going to be distributed. There was a time when that was a really small place. And now that's just exploded because uh, there are so many different platforms. They're all looking for original content. And uh, again, if, if you have quality stuff, for lack of a better word, and it's producible and it's smart and it's you know something that you can kind of make for like a, you know, not too crazy of a number, that's always going to be a thing, you know. So uh, I've, I've always tried to as much as I, I consider myself an artist first, I've always tried to look movies, look at movies like a business. And it's like, if you have something that everybody wants and it's cheap for you to make it, it's going to be successful. You know what I mean? Like if you get the best lemonade stand on the street, lemonade's pretty cheap. We can make a lot of money here, you know? So it's like that, that kind of idea can carry through with films. It's like, all right, what are simple concepts that are easy to make? that are unique and different. And you're probably going to find a home for that if you're able to produce it. And if you can't produce it, you're probably going to have a much better chance of getting funding for it. Uh, so to quote the great Steve Martin, uh, what does it say? What does he say? Be so good that they have no choice but to pay attention to you, you know? Very well said. I do think you're right on that. There's a lot of opportunity out there. I think you just have to find the right audience and the right people that really see what you're trying to do and believe in that so uh I, I don't think there's any someone you know one of my guests said before there's you know there's plenty of room at the table for everybody you know there's there's plenty of room that's why it is important to support each other and and uh you know it's okay to share other people's work and things like that you know don't be so consumed by exact everything that you know you do and all that stuff because there's, there's plenty of room at the table there's just you got to find that right audience and the right person to really want to you know be by your side during that and of course like as you continue your own independent career you're gonna find a lot of kinds of people who have supported you along that way because they love working with you or they want to work with you you know and you're inspiring them so yeah and, and that's that's for sure and also you know self-distribution is a thing like yeah. never before you know there was when i first started making movies self-distribution would be like you selling dvds out of the back of your van you know what i mean like now there are legit platforms where you can put your product out and it, maybe maybe you can build a great social media following and maybe you can get thousands of people to, to be into it or millions. Um, so it's really cool to see a lot of these success stories where people make a lot with a little. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Tommy, man, it has been a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, you got the collective coming out. Is there anything else that you've got kind of in the works or anything else you'd like to talk about and promote for yourself today? Well, you know, I, I've got a goal and my goal is to make an action movie of some kind uh again because i really love the action genre you know it's my first action movie uh the collective coming out on friday i'm really excited about that we just had we just got a great review for the movie uh which is always a nerve-wracking time when those start mm -hmm. to come in um so i love the action movie genre and I'm, i've been inspired to write a couple of action movies uh so i mean you know a real fun goal of mine would be to make one of these waiver movies during the SAG strike. You know, that would be the ultimate goal if I could do that. And, you know, because a lot of times, listen, making movies is like a fun fantasy. It's always been like a, a an exciting job that's been like pie in the sky. But at the same time, it's a job. And it's like, all right, well, uh, be nice to, to make another job for myself. So I've been writing a couple of movies right now, and I'm excited to hopefully, uh, you know, get some traction with that. And Get back on set, man. I really want to. I love directing movies. I miss it. I haven't, I haven't made a movie in a while. So uh, it's hopefully we can get back out there soon. Absolutely, man. Uh, well, you, you've definitely inspired me seeing your journey, your credits, and, and seeing your social media presence. You inspire me. So uh, hopefully the, the audience gets inspired as well. I'm going to put uh, the social media links to you and your YouTube channel here. That way people can check out your work and kind of follow along your journey. I know I'll be following along. Uh, so I do appreciate Tommy for being on the show and uh, just sharing your story. And uh, yeah, it's very, very exciting. Very exciting times. August, I appreciate you. I appreciate you, brother. You've got an awesome energy about you. I wish you the best of luck on your projects. If there's anything I can do moving forward for you uh, to help you with your journey, you let me know. And uh, let's stay in touch, brother. I really appreciate this time. 
For sure, man. Absolutely. Same goes to you. I always like to leave that door open in case there's a collaboration down the road. I'll put it out there for you, man. Uh, so uh, happy to ha- happy to know you. We'll definitely stay in touch and we'll keep uh, we'll keep on moving, guys. So thank you again. And everybody, we appreciate you listening once more. We will catch you next week and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, guys.